Okay. Thank you. Hi, John. How are you tonight? Hey, hey, waiting for everybody to get on. So great. See who's who's on here. Uh, Tom Snook. There we go. How you doing? Nice to talk to you. Dean Wheeler. How are you? Nice to see you, Dean. You know, and uh, Dave Hornby. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> we go back a long way. Oh, my gosh. Uh, oh. Who else? Uh, who else? I it says Katie Murphy. Chances are it's not a woman. That's usually that. Usually it's some guy saying, "Oh yeah, it's using my uh, using my, my wife's account." Uh, let's see who else. Who else is on here? Let's see Bill Barge. How you doing, Bill? You know that's real nice. Uh, I got every, I've got everybody uh, muted out here because um, if I unmute, then. Um, all of a sudden, it's going to be just a lot, lot of noise. Um, and um, usually, I, I may end up having to ask my daughter here. I'm not. I'm, I'm going to try to find my control panel here, so I don't know how to do this. Oh man. Um, there's usually a little thing on the side here. I'm going to have to get some help. I'll be back in a sec. <clears throat> usually there's a column here on the right. So if you hit manage participants, oh, all right, and great. then hit okay. chat, and there you go, everyone's there. All right, great. Okay. Okay, I just unmuted everybody, so it's going to be a, I think the proper word probably is company, but uh, I'll mute everybody back, back up here in a, in a minute or two. So, and... Uh, So there's a, there's a, if you go over on the right hand side, uh, my screen over on the right hand side, Zoom group chat, and that's where you can uh, log in with a, with a question, and then uh, and then I I'll, I'll call on you, you know, when when that time comes. So Dave Hornby, you you guys shut down in in Canada? Is it all all locked down? Is the border still locked down? Yeah, we've been uh, locked down now for seven weeks, John. Uh, I spent a lot of time working on my cars, so it's been a great opportunity, I guess. I guess. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, here, let's, uh, let's get underway because it's just turned 7 o'clock, so... I want to start off tonight, and again, you can use that that uh, uh, section there on the right on the right side. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute all. There we go. Um, and uh, and then if I call on you, you can un, un, unmute yourself. But um, I've had a, a couple interesting things in the past couple of days, and I take a couple of technical phone calls a day. Sometimes I'll get like two, and sometimes I'll get like eight. It just depends. But you, any of you can call me virtually any time um, that you've got you're jammed up on something or it, it can be something simple it can be it can be something really weird so the weird one I wanted to talk to you about I had a guy call me from Denver he'd been working with Paul Deershaw at sports car craftsman in Arvada but he called me because it's like nobody could help nobody could get this sorted out Paul and his guy Ian finally did it turned out on his HIF carburetors that at 4,200 RPM, 80 miles an hour, shouldn't be driving that fast, at 4,200 RPM, 
the gasoline started to dance inside the um, the float bowl so badly in so in some kind of harmonic that the the floats would actually open up and the and the carburetors would overflow and the gasoline would go over and fill up the canister. The car ran horribly in, until you could get it cleared back back out again. And it only happened at that one RPM. So Ian, its sports car craftsman, put a, another carburetor on top of um, on top of the engine so it could pick up the, the vibration with a clear flow bowl on the bottom. I didn't quite understand how they did this, but <clears throat> that's what the, the owner told me. And brought the thing up to 4,200 RPM just sitting there. And sure enough, not only did the carburetors on his car start overflowing, but this extra one started overflowing too. So then the question is, what do you have to do to, to get that sorted out? Um, and that's, you know, change into HS carburetors or change into a Weber downdraft or rebuilding the engine. I thought maybe the flywheel was given the vibration, but who knows? There's also another problem exactly like that on HS carburetors, 62 through um, 71 MGB, um, that inside the float bowl, it sometimes, not always, but sometimes, with a hinged float, with a, with a float that's got the metal hinge, the float will start to shake at a certain RPM. I can't tell you which one. It might be that it depends on, on uh, how loose the float is or something. And the carburetors will actually overflow right at that point. Runs great above that RPM, runs great below that RPM, but right at that RPM, the car doesn't run well because it's getting too rich and you get the smell of gasoline. So these are these are two very bizarre problems. I've never seen it happen, heard of it happening in an HIF carburetor, but there it is. It did. So um, I want to I want to tell you that our next meeting will be Tuesday, two weeks from now, on the nineteenth, Tuesday the nineteenth, and I'll I'll send a note out out again on Facebook and and uh, so forth. And I'll make I'll three times I'll make my unabashed plea. Uh, and thank you to the people who have sent me something on my on my uh, PayPal. That's very very kind. I appreciate that very much. Makes it all more worthwhile. I probably do all all this for free anyway, but it it, it really it, it helps out helps out. So let's see who 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 we got up up here. We got hello so hellos here. I'm looking for a question here. Um, wonder if you. Uh, can have a look at this 10 second video and give me your opinion on what causes this. The car runs fine, except at high RPMs, like 4,000 RPM, but then I've got to watch the video on YouTube. So that's, that's I don't know how to do that here and, and keep everybody, everybody here, but, um, uh, but I will take a look at that at my own time and, and or send me an email about that and I'll talk to you about it. Um, high RPMs, why doesn't a car run well at high RPM? Um, it, can be, uh, it, it can be as simple as the fuel. You've got to be able to, to push a, a pint a minute uh, into, the, into the float bowls. You never could use that that much. That's like enough running time for uh, eight minutes on the road. That doesn't make any sense, but that's what the workshop manual tells you. You want to, the, the fuel pump wants to pump a pint a minute. And the faster you're going, the more gasoline you're, you're using. So all you do is take the fuel line off the carburetor, put it into a can or a bottle, turn on the key, tick, 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 or flutter, or whatever kind of fuel pump you've got. And as long as you're moving a pint a minute, and you can tell right away, it's either, gushing out or it's just dribbling out. But that's one reason that it would run out of fuel at high RPM. Another thing that happens very rarely, midget 1500s it happens on, um, but hardly on the other cars is you get valve float. Um, you know, the, the valves are designed not to keep, the, the valve springs are not designed to keep the valves closed, but to keep the, the cam follower, the lifter on the cam. Um, and, and if the spring is too weak, the cam follower can't go up and down. It, ends, it, it, it doesn't follow the cam all, all the way down and ends up hanging part way open as the cam keeps coming around and you get valve float and that'll cause a problem at high R RPM. 
Other things are like points and dwell. Um, a lot of people have got a, electronic ignition, but I'll take a look at that later and, and see what, what I can do. So um, let, let me just see here. Um, here, here's one from uh, Craig West. I've got a crushed brake line over the differential. Do you have a recommendation for replacing it? You can go to Napa and you can buy brake line, just brake line. Um, and so you can make up a brake line as short or as long as you want. You have to have the brake line ends. So you get to use the old ends. Sometimes the old ends are really crappy. I don't, I can't tell you if Moss sells just the brake line ends. I know that Ingle does, E-N-G-E-L out of Kalamazoo, Ingle Imports. I know they sell just the brake line ends. So you can go to Napa and you can buy the brake line. And then of course, you've got to have a brake line tool to make, to make the ends. Um, you've got three different flares when you're dealing with a tube. You've got single flare, which is like you know, the gas line on the back of your, of your um, stove. And then you've got bubble flare and you got double flare. Bubble and double are interchangeable on our cars. So there's, there, there's, there's no problem using those all, all over the place on our car. Double, double flare or bubble flare either. They're interchangeable. So um, you can go to Napa and you can buy a brake line and, and it's got one end, which is long enough, but the other end's too short. So the brake line that you buy from Napa has only got one good end on it. So you buy two brake lines from Napa, you get the both ends, um, and then you still have to have the tool to, to make the brake line. So there's a bunch of different ways. You can just order the part you want from Moss. Moss has got them. And when you go to bend them, you always use a, a, a double thumb. You just put, put, the, put the brake line across, across your thumb and just bend it very carefully. And uh, you don't want to kink it, but you don't have to buy the brake line tool. Something larger, 3 8 for instance, that runs the clutch, you've got to use um, a, a bending tool there. But for normal brake lines, double thumb works, works just great. So, so the question is, why do those brake lines get crushed on the back of the rear axle? Half of the MGBs out there have got crushed brake lines. Because um, when the tow trucks come by and they snag a hold of the car, you put it up on the flatbed, maybe, they put these hooks underneath the rear axle, grab it, you use some sort of hydraulic thing and eat, ram a thing down, and it crushes the brake line on, on, both, on both sides. Because in our, on our cars, the brake line runs on the, on the MGBs, runs on the front of the rear axle. So those hooks that they put up will crush it. Now, most of the, most of the tow trucks have changed their, their uh, pickup now, and they've got those web things that fit around the tires because they ran out of places to hook them underneath and too many people were complaining. Back in the day when they used to pick the car up and the back end and actually tow it on, on an angle, every summer we'd get calls from the tow truck drivers here in town, the tow services, and they'd say, uh, uh, yeah, we're looking for one of them spinners. And you say, oh, towing the car backwards, huh? And they'd say, how'd you know? <laughs> but you don't have to tow a car backwards for very long at all for one of those spinners to come off. So anyway, Craig, that's, that's the answer with a whole lot of extra stuff on there. So now here we got from Milton. Uh, you can unmute yourself, Milton if, you, uh, Milton, if you'd like. My Speedo operates well, except at startup. And when I stop at a stop sign, after I get going, the Speedo works fine. I've installed a new Speedo cable and the problem persists. Do I need to get the Speedo rebuilt or is there a less expensive solution? Um, and I don't know, I, I, I know Milton's out there. I don't know if I muted. I, no, I'm here, uh, I'm here, uh, John, and thank you very much for taking my question. Yeah, yeah, well, the, the sad truth is, of course, it's not the cable. And it's not how much gas you've got in the tank. It's not the kind of oil you're using. It's yeah. the Speedo. So yeah. you've got to send it off. There's two places you can send the Speedo if it bothers you. If, you know, because it's going to be 150 bucks to have it fixed. Um, you can send it to Nysinger Corporation in Mamaroneck, New York, spelled Mama Ronek, M-A-M-A-R-O-N-E-C-K, 
Nicinger Instruments from Ameranek, New York, or you can send it to uh, West Valley Instruments. I think that's correct. Uh, and they're in San Francisco or Los Angeles. Anyway, those are the extremes of the country, and those are the two places those of us on this end of the country usually talk to Peter at Nicinger. And they'll do a nice job at it. Or if you want, get rid of the Speedo cable altogether, and he'll put a GPS on, on, on the inside of it. So it's all electronic and it all works, but can you do that with positive ground? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I, I like, I like the cable. I, uh, I like, the I like the cable too. And, and I, I want to stick with it. It's just, uh, you know, and, you know, unfortunately an, an, an expensive solution, but it has to be, I think it just has to be. Yep. Uh, and, and it does get to be a little irritating uh, because it, it happens all of the time. And sometimes well, it comes it to a sound a little that you get going and all of a sudden the needle goes pow and, and yeah. settles. Yeah. yeah. Um, on MGBs, there's a problem with the tachometers, the electric tach, 68 through 80. Uh, I don't know about the 77 through 80s, but the, the earlier ones, certainly those are, those have got uh, Texas instrument, uh, Texas instruments guts. And uh, those things stick. It's just a mechanical problem inside it. And you just tap it and it pops right up. You're set to go. But well, well, actually, you know, that's one of the things I was going to ask you about, John, is, should, you know, before I send it off to Neusinger, should I just take it apart and maybe spray the inside with some air and see if there's any dust or anything that's well, sticky? Well, I'd be, I'd be really cautious. But the answer, hey, everything comes apart, right? Yeah. So, but th this is a little more delicate. You've got, a, you've got, that's a 52, 53 in it with a magnetic. It, it's a, it's a 51 actually. Oh, with a chronometric? Yes. Yes. Oh yeah. I, I would, uh, I've never, one of my guys had a couple of those apart a couple of times. I never have taken one of those apart. I've had, I, I tell you in a minute, I've had everything apart on an MG, everything. But yeah. I, I haven't. I haven't had one of those apart. But there, you know, there's no substitute to it. You be real cautious with the uh, um, with the air. But there, there's no substitute for a little drop of oil. Take a piece of wire, dip it in some oil, you know, and then just touch it to whatever you want to oil, and the oil will wick from the from the uh, wire onto whatever it is you're you're trying to do. But one of Peter's complaints. Um, over and over is that the inside of the speedometers get get too oily because oil gets screwed back up the cable and and he'll he'll uh, he'll send a note along and say the reason that you've been having trouble is because we found the the back end of the speedo all packed with grease so it, it's it used to be oil but by the time it's gone all the way up that cable it's dried out a little bit and it it gets it's it's more like grease than than oil so. John, I have taken them apart before, uh, successfully actually, uh, uh, but and they're a bit more robust than than you might think. But uh, I don't want you know. I so I think you know, uh, trying to see if there's a you know uh, some lint or you know debris stuck in there is probably sure. a safe thing to do, and, and maybe even a little a little light oiling, but. Um, it, you know, if I can't figure out, if I can't see any problem, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send it off to Noisinger. So thank you very much. Hey, you're very welcome. Very welcome. All right, let me, I'm going to take a look here and see who's up next. Uh, question regarding, uh, this is from Dowler. Uh, question regarding MGB overdrive operating piston O-rings. The overdrive pressure will build to the proper 400 pounds or so but will not stay engaged under load. But the pressure stays up regardless. So anyway, Mr. Dowler, you want to unmute yourself and let's talk about this. Sure, because thanks for my question there. <laughs> yep. So I'm, I'm wondering, I'm, how, do you, how do you know that the, um, that the pressure is, is maintaining uh, under load, you you got a pressure gauge that comes up inside the car, and you're able to hook this thing up while you're driving. No, I put the pressure gauge underneath and put the car up on stands with my wife driving, <laughs> okay. and I can, and she engages it, and it goes up to 400 pounds. You can hear it; everything hooks in, and then it within about five seconds it spits out 
uh, it disengages, but the pressure stays up to 400 pounds. Oh boy. Oh boy. And driving up and, down, driving up and down the highway, it'll engage and then a little bit of load and it's out. Man. Well, it's, you know, there's always something mechanical that, that, that can be wrong, but there's not much load on the car when you're up running it up, up on a hoist. And that's, that's sometimes a bad thing to do anyway, because the wheels end up spinning at different rates and you can uh, screw up the spider gears, either break them or, or, or uh, uh, um, freeze them up in the, in the diff. Um, but, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to think. It, it's if it's not a hydraulic problem because you've got the pressure. So mm -hmm. why is it disengaged? Because there's something wrong with the cone clutch. I mean, that's the only thing I can think of. I mean, that's you know when when that 400 pounds kicks in and pushes those pistons, which have got a, a cross section of an inch or so each. Got got to be there's there's a lot there's a lot of force on that on that uh, cone clutch. And there's just, I just can't imagine, I can't imagine it slipping. Um, it'll, you know, they'll slip, they'll slip when, when they're shot like that. I'm gonna have to think about that some more. Um, so give me jingle tomorrow or something and it'll all mull that, I'll wake up at three o'clock in the morning and go, geez, why didn't I tell him to, you know, my, my standard line uh, on my YouTube videos about those uh, overdrives is that if you change all the O-rings from underneath, 95% of the time you catch all the problems, but this isn't, this isn't what's going on here. So well, I changed all the O-rings and did the automatic transmission fluid and checked the solenoid. We've replaced the solenoid. And everything works, except well, it won't stay in. <laughs> tell, me, tell me again the, the oil that you're using inside there. Well, um, oh, 10 w, uh, pardon me, 20 W50. Okay, all right. Yep. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's 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 uh, that's it. So I don't know. I, you got me buffaloed. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'll, I'll, but, I'll, but I'll think about it. Cause I'm, I'm, in, I'm always embarrassed when, when I can't answer something. So anyway, okay, here we go from Vincent. Um, can you order parts from Little British Car Company out of Farmington Hills, Michigan, Little British Car Company sells Moss parts. Oh, you can order. Yes, yes, we know that. And I think Moss is shipping again in, anyway. Um, so uh, uh, Jeff Zorn, Jeff and his, his wife Jan uh, started, started, they're a Moss reseller um, and uh, they have a lot of stuff on hand and they, and they, they uh, send stuff out all the time. Um, and, and they also run tours to England once or twice a year, along with Tony Burgess and his wife, Lynn. They both run tours to England, so you can go to the Morgan factory or the Triumph factory or, or where they used to be. Um, and um, anyway, they, they, they both run tours, and Jeff, Jeff's been selling parts for, oh my gosh, 20 years, I think, something under the name of Little, Little British Car Company. So. All right, so here we go. What spark plugs, do, this is, oh, Tom Snook from uh, Coral Gables, I found out today. Um, what spark plugs do you re recommend for a 1956 MGA 1500? Also, what spark plug caps um, do you use or recommend for the Lucas Bumblebee spark plug wires? Well, let's see. Uh, Tom, you can unmute yourself if you're, if you're in there. Yes. Yeah, no. Hey, okay. All right. So nice, a uh, nice ship there behind you, huh? Uh, that's when I was stationed on Governor's Island with the Coast Guard. That's from uh, 1976. Oh my gosh. Okay. All right. So the spark plugs are Champion, uh, Champion N5s. So it's a three quarter inch reach plug. So that's the N and five is the heat range. Um, so, and they actually, they used that N5 plug on the first couple of hundred MGB engines and then, and then jumped to the N9Y. Um, but that, and that's the only one that, that I know. I, um, 
uh, BP, the BPES. I'm not, I'm not sure what the what, what the other numbers would be on the on the other plug, but um, IELTS just by Champion plugs works. They mm -hmm. work great. Some people, you know, like anything else, some people say, oh, you know, in this case, Champion, oh, they're junk. No, they're not. They're just fine. Fine spark plugs. Can you get a bad spark plug once once in a blue moon? Absolutely, you can get a bad anything once it, in a blue moon, but. N fives. Then I think what I'd use is um, you could either get you could order a, a, a wire end set for a T type because those are solid wire. Those bumblebee wires are solid wire, and those have got a nice screw in them. Uh, that would be nice. Um, but the MGA ones, the MGA ones are are, um, are resistor ends, and and you don't need resistor ends, unless you're running electronic ignition. If you're running points, you can run straight wire, but if, if you're running electronic ignition, straight wire can cause some problems. It caused the, the unit to fail. That's personal experience. I lost two Protronics in, oh, I don't know what, two months, one summer, kind of soured. I mean, I'll tell anybody, <laughs> you know, use Protronics, but always carry a separate one. Um, but I lost two of them right in a row, and I think that's because I was running solid wire. But I think the ends, you know, the easy available ones you can get would be from Moss uh, for a, 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 a T-type. Those will plug right on, straight in. So, or you could use the, the ones from an MGA that have got, I think those things are carry around 20, somewhere between 10, 20,000 ohms resistance. And that was to cut down the zzz for your AM radio reception. So, thank you. All right. Okay, now we're on to um, Brian Voss, who who has made a suggestion. Uh, he said bend a brake line around a soup can uh, to prevent kinks. Absolutely, you can. You, actually, you can bend it around um, uh, a spark plug socket. You can bend it around anything rather than double thumb. That is absolutely correct, um, and you can get you can get a nice controlled curve that way. I'm really used to double thumb. I I done a lot of brake lines, so they they look pretty nice. But but you can make them look e even better by using something cylindrical. So okay, now here we got uh, Milton's got another question here, and um, Milton says if I get my drive shaft rebalanced. Well, I have to replace my 10-year-old U-joints. Um, oh, they probably will do that. They'll probably, this is just off the top of my head, Milton, but my guess is that for about 150 bucks, you can get your drive shaft with new U-joints and rebalance. They'll probably do the whole thing at the same time. Maybe they won't change them if it doesn't need them. Um, and um, the U-joints are, you can still get Hardy Spicer U-joints, but wherever you take it is is probably what they're going to. It's a standard U joint. You, they're off. It's an off the shelf item from Napa, uh, so um, it's it's an easy one to do. But for everyone, getting your drive shaft balanced. Oh my gosh, that is just it's so wonderful. You know the drive shaft is what three feet long. Well, almost, and it's a couple inches in diameter, and it's turning at engine speed. So if there's a, a piece of crap on it, if there's a ding in the side of it, if somebody put it in the vise before and bent it, incrementally, it, it'll put up a whole body vibration uh, in the car and getting your existing drive shaft um, balanced is just, it's really nice. If you've got any vibration at speed, at driving at 40 or you're driving at 80, any vibration at all, there's only three things that are gonna give you that vibration. Excuse me, five things, or six if you include the exhaust. And that is four wheels, any one of which can be uh, out of balance, um, or the drive shaft. So uh, you can tell if it's exhaust by sitting, sitting in your driveway and bringing the RPM up, and then very slowly letting it come back down and listen. And if you get a zzzz or some kind of vi vibration, that's your exhaust. But when you're out on the road doing 70, 80 miles an hour, there's only five things turning. That's the drive shaft and four wheels. So your vibration has to come from one of those points. 
uh, Sean or John, I have a, a, a I, I was a little surprised by by this when I um because you know we, we, these are MG in my case a T series drive shaft and and I was a little surprised that that the uh, a drive uh, shop a, a drive line shop that does uh, drive shaft balancing would have the U joints for our um, drive shafts but I, apparently there are universal yeah, and, and it's, it's an off the shelf item it's a, a standard standard stuff just like the just like the the bearing in the back of the tc in the back of the tdtf uh um gearbox is a metric bearing off the shelf item so it, it's there's you know they they did they built a car not all on proprietary parts but on stuff that was available at the time so for whatever reason that that has remained a standard a standard part well easy for me to say god knows that um, you know my uh my 2017 um uh general motor buick no it's a what chevrolet equinox does not use those <laughs> so but i i know that they're available from from napa so oh, okay excellent you know uh, I, I also understand that you can there's two types of universal joints and and, and our my T-series car and all T-series that I've ever seen, they, they have Zerk fittings on for those universal joints. But I'm told that you can also find a, uh, ones that, uh, that don't have the Zerk fittings that are internally and permanently lubricated. That means Is they're that never, true? That means they're never lubricated, except uh, when you put them together. So uh, get, the, get the ones with the Zerks. All right. All right. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so back to Craig West for a moment here. And he said, Craig said uh, that his car hasn't run in 35 years. Should the brake lines be replaced or wait for a leak? Oh boy, you know, it's, it's uh, generally speaking, the steel brake lines don't fail. They just don't, generally speaking. If you see a lot of rust on the, on the outside of them, of course you can't see any rust on, on the inside, but if you can see rust on the outside, that's a nice picture. That, uh, that's just come up here with the B. That's a factory picture. It's nice. Um, um, the um, diverted by the pretty girl here. Yeah, John, is it the, the car that's distracted you or, or the pretty girl? I think it was the pretty girl. Um, so yeah, fact, fact, uh, fact of the matter. So anyway, the, the brake lines, the brake lines are, um, the rubber lines, absolutely, those got to be changed every 10 years, absolutely, because they fail, they, 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 they tighten up on the inside, you can't get brake fluid through them, but the other ones, um, I, I guess if I saw some damage to them, I'd be concerned, but um, uh, if, you, you know, if you stand on your brakes as hard as you can, um, it, literally as hard as you can when you're done do, doing your brakes and you don't get a leak then then I, I'd say that you're safe and if you've got a if you've got I think Craig's got a, a car built after 68 even if you lost half your brakes which is unbelievably creepy uh, you'd still have the other circuit so I, I'm just not used to, to steel lines going bad in MGs at all Barry Jacobs, Barry Jacobs, you're up next here. So you can unmute yourself, Barry. And, and uh, if you're on there, Barry Jacobs, he's yep. asked. Yep. Um, here. You must have the cylinder head off your car, or did you look down in the spark plug holes? Um, down the spark plug holes using an endoscope. Oh, all right. So Barry's complaint is that there's a lot of carbon on top of the piston. How to get rid of it? Two ways. One is go out and run it really, really fast, <laughs> really, and blow the carbon out. Remember, I'm in. That's that's what that's what everybody said they had to do with their grandpa's Cadillac, right? Go out and blow the carbon out, um, and um, and then the other way is is to um, uh, unfortunately, you know, take the cylinder head off and abrasively you know, with a wire brush, uh, rotary wire brush, uh, scrape it off. So what problem is there having it there now anyway? Um, two problems. One is it changes the compression slightly, but 
probably just slightly and it probably isn't a big issue. The second problem though is that there's ridges or edges those can start to get really hot. They can often incandesce and, and it'll light the air fuel mixture before the piston gets up to where the, the spark plug wants to light it. And that's uh, it's called pre-ignition or if it gets real bad detonation um, and that's bad. But if, you know, if the car's running okay, I, I wouldn't worry about it. Modern gasoline's like really, really clean and that doesn't happen quite so much anymore, the, the buildup. But the carbon is from incomplete combustion. So you wanna just double check and make sure that your mixture is correct um, on, your, on your carburetors. What, what, uh, what year model are, are we talking about here? 78. 78. 1978. Okay, that's... Um, um, and the are, engine was redone three years ago. Okay, and you still have the soup bowl pistons in it, or you got flat tops, pistons, you know? They, the uh, original pistons... I think they the soup bowl, because I had the engine, I had the engine redone about three years ago. Because the original pistons are really low compression pistons, and they're really, they've got a real, uh, I mean, it looks like you could eat soup out of them. It really, it really does. They're so deep. Um, and that that lends itself to this carbon build, build up too. So I wouldn't worry about it, just offhand. Yeah, my friend, my friend just told me they flat pistons. Oh, all right, okay, okay. Well, just check your mixture, check your mixture, and just just do do what you can. Eventually, um, some of it may may burn out of there but it's probably adhered to the top of the piston really, really tightly, burned onto it. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give it, I wouldn't mind it. Remember, um, you're from New, New Zealand? Your accent. South Africa. Oh, excuse me, all right. South Africa? Yep. Um, that's okay. They used to sell decoke sets, right? That's, that's what the top end cylinder head gasket was. And on all the BMC cars, that was just part of the regular maintenance. You had to take the head off every so, so many thousands of miles and decoke it. They didn't, or sometimes they were called decarbonizing sets. But in fact, what you've got on top of the piston isn't carbon, it's coke. Um, and so that's why the, those cylinder head gasket sets were called decoke sets or decarbonizing sets. But if the car runs, runs fine, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be excited about it. But would the type of oil make a difference? It shouldn't, because there shouldn't be any oil up there. At least none, none to speak of. Okay. <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah, I mean, if, if you okay, said, just, oh, I'm, I'm just, running this space age exotic oil that no one, no one has any experience with, then I'd say, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe, but I don't, I don't think so. I, I think it has to do with yeah. the mixture. Okay. Okay. Thanks for your help. Hey, you're welcome. All right. So now we've got, uh, we're down to uh, MGB Mio, M I O, uh, or by cable oil from any motorcycle shop. Works great. So this is a comment on the side there, uh, back to Milton Babrak, about cable oil for the uh, Speedo cable. Um, what must be. And now we've got uh, from Larry Maselli from Mount Dora, Florida. Can you describe how to make a 67 MGB tack work with Protronics Ignition or post the directions on your Facebook site? Um, it works, but it reads about two times the correct reading. So I can't show you here because it's complicated, but the, the power uh, on a, on a 65 through 60, 69, 71, uh, around there, the power goes from the key through an impulse loop in the tack and down and powers the coil. So the tachometer is reading the pulse of the electricity going down to the coil. With the, with the, um, with the protronics, the dwell isn't long enough and so the tack gets confused and, and doesn't read what's really going on. So you end up having to add a wire and, and, and 
in this impulse loop that I'm talking about, which is on the back of the tack, you have to you have to put that between the coil and um, between the coil and the distributor, and that will give you a, a, an honest to goodness honest to, to to goodness flash. But there's there's also a potentiometer in the back of the tachometer uh, that you can adjust uh, to get a correct reading. So, or you can send it to Nisinger and they'll, they'll just put in very modern guts and, and that'll take care of it too. But I will post that on my Facebook site tomorrow, not tonight, okay. but tomorrow. Okay, so we're coming down our line here. Um, Cone Clutch, Brad in, oh my gosh, I can't even pronounce where, where, where you're from. Um, but uh, the Cone Clutch, that must be have to do with the, uh, the earlier complaint about the, the overdrive. So you can buy a new cone clutch, you can buy a new one from Moss, or you can go on the web and you can go to uh, overdrive repair services in Sheffield, England and deal with them directly. And they have, they have rebuilt cone clutches. You gotta send your old one in to get it re refaced. But of course, this is just a monster project. You gotta take the engine and gearbox out of the car take the whole overdrive all apart. And, oh my gosh, a lot of work um, to, to, get down, uh, to get down to the part that you, you, you've got to change. So if that's the, pro if that's the problem. But anyway, there's overdrive repair services in Sheffield and you could call them too. That's an idea, you call them and say, what, 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 you know, what's going on? How, how come I've, I've got this problem with that, that clutch kicking in? So now we've got from Crystal, from Crystal, you can come in if you'd like uh, on SUHS three carbs. There are there are three, but these are probably twos or fours. When putting the piston back in after cleaning it, do I put oil on the outer edge or leave it dry? And that's that's the 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 machine surface on the air piston inside the suction chamber, um, inside the inside the uh, carburetor. Eventually it's going to all get sucked out, out of there. So I would just leave it dry. I mean, cause it's, it's, um, it's all, it, it, there's, there's just an enormous vacuum in there. You just can't imagine. And that air is trying to slip up on the sides and whatever's in there, it's going to pull it out, out of there and, and um, eventually into the airflow. So no, I just put, put it back to together dry. Now here, Joe Pryor, uh, it says regarding that overdrive issue, I had I had this issue on my 73B a couple years ago. My mechanic found a bad electrical connection behind the dash. Okay, that is one of many reasons why an overdrive wouldn't work. But in this case, we've got our, our oil pressure remains constant, which means that the solenoid is working, the oil pump is working, the oil pressure relief valve is working, all of it's working and yet it's still kicking out of overdrive. So it's not an electrical issue, although um, for many, many, many uh, problems with overdrives, um, it, it is. All right, so now, now we get Dean Wheeler um, and uh, Dean wonders if it's, if it's uh, possible to rebuild the shuttle valve. Um, PDWA. I'm so, I'm sorry, Dean. You, you got to co come in and 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 and. Uh, I'm Break fill your switch. Okay. Break fill your brake fill your block. Okay. So um, um, without removing it from the car, I think you want to remove it from the car because it's such a mess. You know, I, I think you want to get it out of the car and uh, and and get the thing apart. Could you do it? Yeah, but it's going to take air pressure, and you're going to be blowing brake fluid all, all over. So, so I, I think it, it would just be wiser to to uh, um, take it take it off the car, and then and then you got the chance to polish it all up and make it look all nice and brass. So you, there's two types of those shuttle valves. Uh, the earlier ones use um, a lipped seal that I was never able to find. Most of the later ones, you you're, you got what a seventy one seventy? Yes, seventy one. I bet that's got just O rings in it. I don't know what size they are, double O fours or something. There's just it's a fractional O ring. 
so you get you get the thing apart. Um, um, but the the piston comes out of there with extreme difficulty. So um, I, that's what I, I was wondering about. It. This this whole thing started because the light came on by itself, just sitting in the garage one day. So why I not? The switch. I pulled the switch out of the block and looked down in there, and I could see that the shuttle valve had moved to the rear. Well, so that's the usually that's usually because there's a problem with the rear brakes and the pressure in the front circuit has pushed the pushed it to to the rear so right. maybe maybe rather because the only reason you rebuild it is if it's leaking so it's leaking. so adjust the rear brakes go go through all, all that adjust the rear brakes jump up and down on the pedal a couple of times that valve should set itself centrally located and i've tried everything to get the thing to center and it won't center i mean i can't get it to move the brakes are fine. I've, I've tested the front and the rear brakes. They're, they're both good. But that shuttle valve that somehow moved to the rear, huh. I can't get it back forward. And the light stays on, so all, all I've done is disconnect the switch. So if you open, if you open up a front bleeder and, and, uh, and build some pressure up in the, in, the brake, in, the, in, in the rear brakes, it should push that shuttle valve, uh, and it'll, it'll push it uh, let me think. The rear brake, the, the rear part of the shuttle valve is at the rear of the valve, and that's got the two fittings, one in, one out. Um, right. So any, anyway, and your your piston has moved all the way to the rear? Well, just barely to the rear, but it's enough to trigger the switch. Okay, so, so open up one of the bleeders up front and uh and and jump on the jump on the brake pedal a couple of times and see if you can build up pressure in the rear circuit to push that piston forward again. Okay, I'll give that a try. You know, because while I was doing that, I figured I'd just re put the new O-rings in the shuttle valve. Sure. It sounds sure. like it's more trouble than it's worth. Well, if it's not leaking. Yeah, but of course, when it's all done, it's all nice and brass again. You can make them look really nice. So. It looks good already, but I, I just okay. it's bugging me because I can't get the light to go out. <laughs> and of course, yeah, the cheap trick, of course, is leave the wire loose but um yeah that I, I i would do that i'd i'd open up the front and it may be that, that the thing has been stuck for so long in some kind of position that moving it is going to tear up one of those o-rings and it will start to leak yeah. um, so anyway when you go to take it apart um what you do is you take a three eighths bolt and a ball bearing and put it in one end in the rear and then put air pressure on the other end of the rear and that puts pressure behind the piston that'll push the piston out the front once you get the, once you get the big, uh, that's a huge uh, three quarter inch nut I think on, on the front. It'll blow that piston out. Sometimes you gotta put a screwdriver in and catch the edge of it and free it, move it or move the piston all the way to the rear and, and by doing so, you, you, you break the seal between the O-rings and, and the inside of the, of the cylinder if it's, if it's really stuck. Uh, just um, bang it in there a bit with a punch and a hammer. Not, not very hard, but just get it to move and then put air pressure on the ass, ass end of it and it'll, it'll push it back out. So. Okay, I'll give it a try. Thanks, John. Okie doke. All right. Okay, now we're going Tony Shoviak. Uh, what about using sea foam in the gasoline to help build to clean out the carbon? Sure. Hey, that's I, sure. I, I don't. I no idea if that kind of stuff works or not. A lot of that stuff to me seems like snake oil, but I don't know. You know, maybe our our guy can tune in next time, go out and buy some sea foam and run that run that through your engine and and uh, and see. So Tony's uh, Tony's an owner of a of a TD an MGA, uh, an MGB, an MGC, and an MG1100. They all run, but he hasn't got enough people at home to drive all of them. So, nice to see you, Tony. Thank you, John. Um, John, can you yes. hear me? Yes. In 2003, I was having the problem with the, um, at a certain RPM, the, the MGB would, misfire and bounce around yeah i talked to i talked to bob mason and he said to use the viton tip from a jaguar because he said it was getting a harmonic harmonic bounce in it and he told me to use seafoam well i thought he was pulling my leg i 
leg. I had never heard of seafoam before. <laughs> and I went to the store and I'm walking around Napa going, you sell seafoam? And the guy said, oh yeah, we got a bunch of it on the bottom shelf. I thought he was <laughs> kidding me. And um, I did use it when I had my 2008 Mini Cooper. It's a direct fuel injection. And you'd have to pull off the, um, the, the tube from the uh, air uh, rocker cover that would take the bypass because it was a direct fuel injection. It would The valves would load up with carbon and you'd spray it in there and you'd get this horrible smoke coming out the back. But the car has 135,000 miles on it. Now my neighbor owns it and he has not had to take it in to get the valves clean. So okay. it must be working. Hey, okay, seafoam. Well, there's something about um, getting water in there too. And I don't know if it's the steam yes. or the shock or the change and pressure or I no I, I you know there's all kinds of stuff that that, that you hear so yeah how uh, good interesting so thanks well, one other question yeah one other question for you when you did my um, switch did you grind this end off, this piece off here on the front or did you did you grind it off the back um, on the turn signal switch for the 1100 um. Uh, under underneath the electrical part. Okay. Okay. Where, okay. Where the screw is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. No. See you, Tony. See you later. Hey, John. Yes. Yeah. So another note on the sea foam. Uh, I've been running it in the gas tank. Um, I run it about every three or four tanks, and it actually has a huge effect on the mileage. Uh, really? I'll put it. I'll put a can of sea foam in with the tank of gas, and I'll get a. 27, 28 miles to the gallon, and three or four tanks later, it'll continually go down to about 22, maybe 23 miles a gallon. Put another can of sea foam in, and it goes back up. So I haven't done a, a cleaning where you suck it into the block, uh, but it really does seem to affect the gas mileage, at least on my car. Okay, all right. So it's it's obviously doing something, obviously doing something. So hey, cool, cool. So here we got a note back from uh, Crystal that said HS4 typo, but I can't remember what the original question is. Crystal, you, are you there? Or whoever uh, whoever's using Crystal's uh, computer, you can, you can unmute yourself and come in and, and uh, cause I don't remember. It was right above that, it was the HS3. Yeah, right, uh, right. Uh, right. What, 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 what was your question originally? What was the original? It's not me, but they ended up putting oil around the piston in the dash. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sure, sure. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, all right. Okay, now from John Trishak to everybody, is there a cheaper over-the-counter replacement wiper blade for the MGA instead of having to buy one from a vendor? Well, you're still going to have to buy it from a vendor, but what you mean is why do I have to pay 20 bucks for a wiper blade twice a season? I think that's probably what what uh, what John means. And there's a couple of different styles of of wipers. Uh, the original MGA wiper blade, I think it's just a, um, a one time deal. But you know, Trico used to have because we used to do that sometimes on wiper blades that we couldn't get or when stuff would fall out of um, supply, we'd go to Napa and we'd buy inserts. And, and a single-edged razor blade, and we'd make those inserts work on Bs and GTs and stuff. So can you do that on an MGA? I don't know. Can you switch the arms on an MGA to early MGB? No, they're too long, so you got to do something there. Um, but if you do that, you get the hook, and once you got the hook on the end, and you can you can a, a more modern style, then you can put a more modern blade on it. And what I mean is less ancient. Nothing's modern on our cars, um, but something maybe that that fit other cars from the 50s or 60s, and may, maybe it would be less. Or maybe um, somebody in England is selling a wiper blade that that will last longer than the one that that you're buying right now. So, you know, you think, oh, you know, going to England is too complicated and everything. It's not. Um, you can order something from England and it will come just as quickly as it comes from any one of the major suppliers in this country. Um, and and so, sometimes it's better, not always. They get their stuff from our favorite uh, East Asian country too. Uh, and just because it says made in England doesn't mean that it's better. 
um, um, but try the, try the MG Owners Club in Swayze, Moss, uh, England. Uh, Mo you know, we go, well, yeah, I'm buying it from Moss now, you know? Well, Moss England and Moss America are the same corporate structure, uh, same corporate owners, but they're not the same company and they do have different parts. And there's a bunch of other people in England that sell um, MG parts also. So that, that's, that, I mean, that, all that's a, a possibility. Jim Holiday, flat towing your MGB um, and the MG and the MGA. You asked me that this last year um, when we were to, when I saw you someplace. But uh, Jim's Jim's from London, Ontario. You can come in if you want, Jim, uh, from London, Ontario, and uh, he's now retired, and so he wants to flat rather than get a trailer and put his put his car on a trailer and go through all that all that kind of stuff. Um, can you just put the car on the ground and attach something to it and tow it? The problem, the problem that I've seen, have I seen it? Maybe twice or three times. It just bugs me because I, I know what's going on inside there. When you're towing the car, the rear wheels are turning, the differential's turning, that's fine. There's all oil back, back in there, that's no problem. The drive shaft is turning, and inside the gearbox, the main shaft is turning. Well, in order for the gearbox to lubricate itself, the, the lay gear, the counter gear has to spin and that throws oil up, throws it into a trough, that trough comes back, the oil drips down, it goes to an oil pump that's on the main shaft and it gets screwed back up into everything. So if the, if the counter shaft, uh, or counter gear, lay gear, is not spinning, you're not throwing all that oil up inside the gearbox. So how far can you tow your car before you encounter some damage? And I don't know. I don't can know. You, uh, John, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, hey. Anyway, it's good to see you, by the way. And I love that reel-to-reel -reel back there. Does it still work? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll turn yeah. it on next time. Your yeah, backdrop yeah. reminds me of my my college room in the in the, uh, in the early seventies. Yeah, um, I think I got in in a God of Davida on the tape right right, right now. Yeah. One of, the, one of the suggestions you you uh, threw out to me was to overfill the tranny, and that's kind of one of the options I'm looking at. What are the what are the problems with doing that, and then pumping it, you know, sucking it out once you arrive? Um, the only problem is that the uh, is it doesn't matter if it leaks out the rear seal, right? Because it just um, uh, undercoats the car, rust protects it. But the um, but if it goes out the front, if it goes out the front seal, uh, it's going to end up getting on the clutch. So um, or it could end up get, getting on the clutch. So if you can get underneath there to drain the oil out or get inside it to drain the oil out, um, geez, it seems as though you'd be able to get underneath there and and take be able to take the uh, Take the drive shaft off, but that's just a bugger. I know it is. You gotta, you gotta, you know. I mean, you can lie in the ground, but or take a piece of carpet w with you, a couple of half inch wrenches. But you need a jack and jack stands, and and it's a what a hassle, especially if you just you're going someplace temporarily. If you're if you're driving to Arizona uh, and staying there for four months, then you can make a case for jacking it up and putting it on jack stands and taking the drive shaft off. And if you're driving, if you're pulling it to Arizona. I, I would do, I do something. You know, you're going from, from London to Toronto, London to Windsor, coming no, here. It would, be, it would be Arizona, Florida. Oh and yeah, so no, you, you, you've got, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm just, um, you know, you can talk to some other people. Uh, um, um, John Esposito runs Quantum Mechanics in Connecticut. Quantum Mechanics. And and he does a lot of gearbox work, and you could just call and ask him what what he thinks about it. I, I you know, it's it's um, you, you sure don't want to eat it up. You sure don't <laughs> you sure don't want to ruin your gearbox. You know, but and and so where's he located? Where is he located? Uh, uh, Connecticut, but he, he's you'll find him on Google. You know, quantum mechanics. Thank you. All right. All right. I, I, I wish I had a real, you know, absolute um, 
fair one, but I, I mean, a, a better answer, but I, I don't, so. So say hi to Sid. Will do. All right, see Thank ya. You. All right, next one up is Rich Caldwell from Houston. Um, any hints on repairing a, the gas, the um, must be the sending unit in the, in the, in the gasoline tank. Yes. You can un unmute, hey, there we go, I've been there. So are you talking about the sending unit inside the gas tank? Yes. Okay, on an MGA? Yes. Okay, so the unit comes out and you'll see that there's, there's a, 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 a cylinder about that long that's wound with resistor wire. You very carefully, you lever that from each end, you get it out, it's grounded to the body and it's got the wiper on it, okay? The wiper has um, a wire that's wound around an axle and that too is grounded because the, the wipers, otherwise the wipers are gonna have to, have to ground through the axle and that's not a good ground. That's why on MGAs the gas tank flicks back and forth because it's making a bacon ground. Not, not sweeping is the gasoline sloshes, but actually on off, on off is it's making contact. So the main problem in there is you, usually with that is that the, um, you need a piece of wire that goes from, the, from the, the little electrodes that sweep, wrap it around the, the axle a couple of times and, and bring that up. Um, you'll see when you take it apart. But I used to take them apart. I'll, I'll send you pictures. I'll, I, I, have, I have pictures and I'll send you pictures. So I, it's, um, you know, if you take one of the newer ones apart, instead of 400 windings, you know, there's like 60 in the, uh, they just aren't made of the same quality, you know, so. Well, so, while I have you, Matt, someone mentioned seafoam. On, on my 1600, I've gotten near 30 miles a gallon since I bought the thing in 82, even through the, um, the, the tune-up. And this, this last rebuild, you know, that piston came apart. This last rebuild, I'm down at 20. And I went, what happened? I mean, everything's the same, but obviously something isn't, and I haven't figured it out yet. Um, well, there's two possibilities. One is there's something wrong with the, with, the, with, the, with the gasoline supply and that you're getting too rich of a mixture. Well, it's real know? cheap, eh, <laughs> um, And the only way to find out, the only way to find out whether you're running that 14 to one is to put a sniffer up, up the tailpipe. That's the only way you can do it. You can read the spark plugs and see if they're black or tan, but if they're tan, uh, then the, then what's coming out the tailpipe will be okay. And then from there, unfortunately, we have to go back to cam timing. So, so that's the whole front end of the engine is. I, I, I would hear that though, wouldn't I? Last, no. No? No, no. The, 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 the inlet valve should be fully open at a standard stock, a stock cam. The inlet valve um, is open at 110 degrees after top dead center. And uh, when you when you start to buy more exotic camshafts, it'll go all, all the way up to to. Uh, it's the, Anton Street Hot Cam. Okay, so so the question is, was that installed correctly? Hmm. Okay. And you you can find that out using a dial indicator. You can use a dial indicator, and 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 you can make it all work. You got to have a degree wheel, and a dial indicator, and you can't do that in place. Um, cause you can't get a, a degree wheel on the front pulley on your engine. So you end up having to put a degree wheel on the fan. The fan turns at a different speed than the front pulley. So you have to make a, a mathematical correction for that. But I'll, t I'll talk to, I'll, I'll tell you how to, how to do it. it. It's, it's lots of fun. It's a tool. Maybe you don't have another reason to go out and buy, buy a, a new tool, a, a magnetic dial in, indicator but uh, you can you can tell exactly where your cam timing is so thank you okay all right okay so our next one up here is uh mgb mio okay i love that real to real cabinet behind you great yeah okay crystal all right so we're back to john uh Tershak. 
John, the, the MGA wiper blade is inter, the MG must be B wiper blade is interchangeable with the A. I was looking to uh, looking for a cheaper buy on the blade. Napa comes out when used. Uh, on the MG distributors, such as the MGA and MGBs and midgets, are the distributor cams all the same? Are they interchangeable? Yes. Yes. After uh, on on uh, af after we get away from the DM2 and go to the 40 uh, go to the 25D distributor, then all the cams are the same. They're all a high lift cam. They give you a 60 degree dwell inside the distributor so um the they're all the same they don't change until you get to the 45d and the 45d is an asymmetric cam goes back to a, a style of cam that they used on on the t-types not interchangeable at all but the same idea that the points open very quickly and then close very slowly um but the not the mga but the but the earliest mgbs and uh, all the way up through 74 um, MGB and uh, all the midgets, Austin Americas, Austin Marinas, Minis, it's all, it's all the same cam. Um, although each cam is rated as to how far it advances and it's stamped on a little finger. And in the case of an MGB, it's stamped well, like a 60, uh, 67B, it's stamped 10 degrees. On a 74B, it's stamped 18 degrees, which are the distributor degrees that, that are allowed to advance. So even though the cams are interchangeable, they have different advance, advances, and you've got to figure out what you're doing and where you want to go with this to make it work correctly. So and the only reason you change yours is it was really rusty on the outside and was tearing up your points, or it was really loose on the on the shaft and you're getting some wiggle um, on the top, which which uh, can change your change your your um, your points, your opening. So anyway, you can contact. Give me a call tomorrow. We can talk more more about it. And here we got Tony. Tony says you can get Tex wiper arms and wiper blades from Tex Automotive in the UK. And, and on the sidebar there, Tony's got texautomotive.com. So those are all available from, from the, the, the UK. So that, that runs me out to the end of my, of my uh, questions that people have asked, but I'm happy as always to entertain any more questions that anyone might have. So you can unmute yourself and ask, and you'll come up, um, or you can type something in the sidebar. So otherwise, you got to listen to me prattle on for a bit, which I'll do until somebody else comes up. So, hey, John. John. Yes. John. John, it's Brad here. Brad? Yeah. Uh, my father's got a TR6, and about three quarters of the time, but not all the time, when you Engage the starter, she spins, doesn't engage the flywheel, just spins. Yep. And, and then all of a sudden, for no reason, it works. It's it's screechy. When it spins, it's screechy. It uses yeah. screeches. Well, there's yeah. a there's a sprag clutch inside the starter motor, and that's what's faulty. So it's this it's this sprag clutch. There's a gear, and when you engage the starter motor on a TR6. Wait a minute. It's not a crash starter. It's a pre-engaged starter. It's yeah. a pre with a solenoid on the starter. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the solenoid pushes this gear, pushes this gear into the flywheel, and once that's in, once it's pushed in, then it starts to to spin. So it pushes it in. The armature starts to spin, but the sprag clutch doesn't carry the doesn't carry the gear. So you got a sprag clutch because as soon as the engine starts to run, it's running faster than the starter motor, and it's it. If you every now and then we used to see the cars come in that this that the the starter motor had engaged while the engine was running, 
And so the starter motor, I don't know how fast the starter motor turns. I'm just gonna pick a number, 1500 RPM, I don't know. It spins it up to, you know, 60, 80,000 RPM. It blows up inside. I mean, it just, it comes apart. So that's why that sprag clutch is there to protect the armature from spinning too, too quickly. So where, where are you calling from? Uh, up in Canada, the car's in Calgary. Okay, in well, there's, there's, someone, there's somebody in Calgary that still does Lucas rebuilds, they're the starter, starter generator shops, starter alternator shops, they'll still do it. Um, you can either take, uh, you can either take a, a used one off another unit and replace it, um, take, take it to a starter shop, they'll, they'll figure out how to, how to fuss it around. So and, even though you think this has failed, it, it still can behave intermittently like this? Oh yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. And, you can spray on it or there's no incantation that you can you can uh pray over it or anything so so where are you you're not in cal you're not in calgary yourself though no i'll talk to him he's got a spare starter we can throw in there so maybe we should try yeah, that but that's start. that's the problem yeah, i see they got the they 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 uh uh canceled the mgb meet in calgary and now i, now I see that even the stampede's been been uh yeah yeah, yeah. unusual year Unusual year. To yeah, say, well, we'll, say we'll the see least. 2022. Yeah, cool. All right. Right. Okay. Hey, John. Yes. Uh, you were talking about decoking engines, and it reminded me of something we used to do in the 60s with, you know, our downdraft carburetors, uh, you know, on, on American stuff. We'd pour a, a, a bottle of uh, water, a Coke bottle of water down the carburetor, rev the engine up, and that supposedly was cleaning the valves and the piston tops. Yep, I, I I made mention of that about adding water to it. I you know I don't know. There's all kinds of all kinds of stuff that you heard back then. Um, there was um, it used to be that they um, let's see how how, do, how does this go? Um, they used to color a really crummy gasoline with a dye, like a red dye. So when you were buying the gasoline that was under 80 octane or something, or is all this all after the Second World War? Um, they 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 had a dye in it, so you wouldn't accidentally use the wrong stuff. It turns out if you put a mothball, dropped a mothball into the gasoline, it, it would it would get rid of the red color. Therefore, you jacked up the octane, right? Because now it was the color of the higher octane stuff. So it was all that weird. I mean, it didn't. It, all it did was put a mothball in your gasoline, but. Um, uh, there's all that stuff you heard, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, the racers used to say the mothball truck used to give them higher octane. The uh, the other thing is, is that do uh, what? There was another old trick, and that was putting transmission fluid into your oil. You know, like a, a half a liter to before you went in for an oil change to help clean it. Any thoughts thoughts about that? Well, old oil used to be real crummy. All the modern oils are so great used to, I mean, inside cylinder heads, you'd get, you'd get a quarter inch buildup. I'm, when, I, when I started working on MGs, you get a quarter inch buildup inside the cylinder head of, of just nasty, vile, disgusting, yucky oil. And the, the engines that we were taking apart at the end, um, end of my business, they were relatively clean on the inside. Same thing with exhaust valves. On the inside of the exhaust valve, you get this white powder lead um, that, that had built up and it severely restrict the, the movement of the, of the uh, hot gases out of the, out of the engine. And, you know, you take those valves over to the wire wheel and you grind it and get all that, all that uh, white powder all, all over, breathe it, you know, when you were cleaning it. And modern, modern stuff just doesn't do, do that at all. But Marvel, you can still buy Marvel Mystery Oil and they, and they have all kinds of claims on the back of the can. It'll do all kinds of great stuff. So, so. Well, you're, ab you're absolutely you're absolutely right about the fuel on the race car, the twin cam race car. I used to run track uh, uh, leaded fuel, you know, the expensive stuff, and uh, then I got tired of that, and I switched it to, uh, to just uh, high test uh, um, unleaded. And I can't get over how clean the plugs look. It's just amazing. It, it is. It's it's um I, and. Uh, uh, Rich, who was on, on here before, is a uh, metallurgist, but he works in the oil industry and he knows a lot 
a lot about oil. So I've got another question here from uh, Ron McDonald. I'm rebuilding a four-speed synchro gearbox. The manual recommends Duckworth Molly disulfide grease on the shaft. You know, um, I, I only ever use NGLI number two lithium-based grease. I, that's all I use for anything was just lithium-based grease. So I, you know, um, I, you know, you can, you can look for that. I don't, I don't know what Molly disulfide grease is. I just don't. Um, um, I know what lithium grease is, and that that's the stuff you can buy at, at Napa. But yet tonight, they're still open till nine. So, um, and John Trishax asked um, for a number to call me. Uh, and it's on my website, but my phone number, don't everybody call tonight, is 616-307-6737. I'll give that to you again, 616-307-6737. And I forgot at the half an hour point to make my unabashed plea for everybody to go on my website and press the little yellow PayPal button that says help John afford his retirement and give me a, a, a donation, but it would be, be very nice if you did. So here we got Chip uh, from Houston who says that I rebuilt a carburetor for him and it didn't work correctly until he replaced the charcoal in the, in the, in the uh, charcoal canister. Now it, is, now it runs great. So the, the charcoal canisters that were hooked to the carburetors from 1972 onwards, um, those uh, those have to be absolutely free to breathe. If they're not free to breathe, then they get a vacuum in them because the engine's always always created in a vacuum the way it's hooked up, and that vacuum gets transferred over to the float bowl, and the float bowl then you've got ga you've got vacuum on top of the gasoline instead of pressure on the gasoline. And so you get too lean of a mixture. That's why the anti-run-on valve installed 60, uh, 73 through 80, that's how that works, by putting a massive vacuum on top of the gasoline in the float bowl, and the car just stops dead uh, for lack of that. But anyway, that's, that's, that's why. So, and uh, Tony's, uh, oh, Tony's still on the seafoam thing. You can all use, also use a small amount of sea foam to help you clean inside of the engine. So, oh my gosh. So, um, and I'll take my last one here uh, from Mr. Borkman, uh, or it says, Jim and Clarence, New York, my MGB pulls to the right on, and then his keyboard get, gave up. So his MGB pulls, drifts to the right on acceleration or deceleration, I'm sure uh -huh. that. On braking, John, it drifts to the right on braking. So I'm wondering, do I have a frozen caliper on the left-hand side? No, it's your rear brakes. Um, oh. there's, there's, well, I'll, I'll go through the explanation. If you, if you step on the brake and your steering wheel turns, I mean, your steering wheel turns left or right, that's a caliper. But if the car just drifts, yeah. that's the rear. Okay, it's just drifting. So yeah. adjust the brakes. And that's, it's just well, one side isn't working. Rear okay. brakes, uh, when I was in business for 45 years, that was our most common repair was rear brakes on an MGB. And you go and you replace the cylinders and the shoes and the rear hub oil seals, turn the drums, put it all, all back together. It works great until it, until it doesn't work again. <laughs> anyway, this is the, uh, the the end of it. I've I've given out my phone number here. You can go on my website and get it there too. If you got any questions at all, you can call me. Almost any. If I don't get it, I'll I'll, I'll answer later. Um, and you can email me. But if you want an answer right away, call me because uh, I I I I'm, I would be embarrassed beyond embarrassed to tell you how many messages I've got in my email box. So I'm not like Ann Landers. I don't answer everyone. I, I would hope to. I would try to, but I don't. That's a fact. So anyway, gentlemen, ladies, if there are any ladies out there, um, we'll see you later. And uh, stay octagonal and uh, safety fast. Thank see you.
Hi, right, John. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Great, great thank job. You John. 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 Good night. See you later, thank you, John. John. See you later, Jim. Good oh. yeah. night, John, boy. Thanks, John. Okay. Uh, Henry from uh, Henry from Alberta. Oh boy. So. Okay. People are people are clicking out here. So. Anyway, yep. Stay safe. Wear those masks. And uh, don't go into a dollar store not wearing a mask. Really, there's, <laughs> really? There's, there's trouble. There's trouble there. Yeah, some somebody somebody got mad and, and uh, came back and shot shot the guy dead. You know, oh, some geez. poor poor guy making up make probably getting paid mi minimum. His only job is to make sure that people enter the store safely. Right. Exactly. Uh, it's just and they it's crazy. It at the one garden center that I go to. Yeah, crazy I think he was guy. a security guard. That was in Flint. Yeah, but he, you know, what's he making? Yeah, Twelve bucks an hour? You know, he's yeah. just you know, he's just a guy. You know, he's just a guy. He's doing his guy. job, yeah. Yeah, just doing his job. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. But it, it's um I, I feel sorry for these chief executives because you you got the scientists who want to keep us you know, in our houses until Christmas. You got the economists well, that say uh, if everybody doesn't get back to work by tomorrow, you know, the cure is going to be worse than the disease. And you got the constitutional lawyers, and then you got the threat of civil disobedience. I mean, everybody saw those pictures of the guys in Michigan. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know why you get the oh, Oh, at know, the Capitol, I, yeah. Yeah, walking into the Capitol with the AK forty seven. Looking, I mean, the last the last time there was any serious problem was uh, nineteen fifty two, maybe when the Puerto Ricans <laughs> came, came into the into the house in the in Washington and shot up shot up the house, the Puerto Rican separatists. So oh. yeah, it's, you know, and so these chief executives have to wind their way through all this stuff. It's not easy. Difficult stuff. <laughs> Sorry for it. Yeah, that is true. So, so anyway, so everybody stay safe. You too. Yeah. yeah. Take care, John. All right. Take Mike, care, John. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Sign it off. Thanks, all right. John. See ya. Bye. -bye.